Hey, it's Jeff Zito, and welcome to another episode of Celebrity Jobber, talking to celebrities and finding out what their big break was. You know, maybe if that big break didn't happen, they'd be just a, a regular, ordinary ham and egger like you and me. What was their first job? My first job was delivering newspapers, and then when I was about 15 or 16, I worked at a dinner theater. Pretty much everybody's got a first job, unless you were born famous, like uh, Kardashians. But, you know, most of us don't fall into that category. My guest this week is a friend of mine by the name of Phil Verone, the drummer for the band Saigon Kick. He was also in Skid Row. He's played with Jakey e. Lee, who was the guitarist for Ozzy Osbourne. He's been in a ton of bands. And he's also done a lot of other stuff, which he's going to tell us about. And I'm telling you, this guy has lived a full life. He's done it all. And I'm happy to tell you, he's still here to tell the story. And maybe 20 years ago, we didn't know if he was going to be here to tell the story. So it's good news all the way around. Check this out. Saigon Kicks drummer Phil Verone, my guest this week on Celebrity Jobber. Hey, Vito, it's Phil. How are you, by the way? I haven't talked to you in a while. Uh, I'm good. I'm yeah? good. Uh, you know, hanging out. I'm over in Vegas, chilling, you know. Oh, okay. in Vegas. Uh, I know Phil Verone, Saigon Kick, and Skid Row, rock star drummer. Yeah. I know Phil Verone, stand-up comedian. I know Phil Verone, author, uh, porn star, if you will. Um, <laughs> a- a- am I missing anything else? Flowing locks. Um, no, that's about, that's, look, I, in my time, okay, anybody who knows me knows that I, my philosophy of life is you never know, you know, when you're going to go. So enjoy, do things, you know, experience stuff. So over my years, the music business definitely allowed me to do many things. And that's like, you know, stand up, acting, all those kind of things, as well as, you know, shooting and and with the adult industry and all that stuff. And I have no regrets, you know, like the things that I did put my daughter through college, uh, you know, FSU, you know, Florida. I mean, these things that I experienced through life are just that they're experiences. They mold you. They, you know, make you who you are today. And now in my older age, I'm uh, going to be 57 this year. But what had happened was during COVID, uh, I was on the road with Jakey e. Lee. Um, drumming was killing me. I mean, my, my body is not like it used to be. So like, you know, when I was 30 and, you know, doing drugs every night and all that stuff and, you know, uh, partying, I was fine. And then all of a sudden I go on the road and, you know, no drinking, no, no chick, no nothing, no, no drugs. And my body, you know, told me like, listen, dude, you know, you might want to think about <laughs> something else right. to live your life out. And then COVID hit and then touring was over anyways. And at that point I was already dabbling in filmmaking and um, editing. Uh, so I really just dove in and studied film editing and, and editing in general and for, for the whole COVID. And then um, right coming out of it, I got my first job as an editor um, and then I moved to another company and I've been with this company for about a year and a half now. And, uh, I do all the, um, all the ads for their products. I edit all the, uh, all the advertising and I'm also editing films on the side. So yeah. you're editing, is it like sound, like sound design editing or are you talking about words? Well, no, it's, it's for lack of a better term, video it's Okay. Video editing. So when you, uh, I do all the ads that are on the social media platforms, on television, um, uh, as well as other, you know, forms, whatever they, whatever they place an ad, basically. Uh, but on the side, uh, along with that, I'm studying to be film editor, like Hollywood film editor. Wow. So I already edited, um, I already edited a film uh, and did the sound design on that. It actually won awards. So I won my first sound design awards uh, for that. And then I'm, you know, but but my my regular job is just doing ads for advertising. So can you tell me? Can you rewind in your life? Born in Long Island, moved to Fort Lauderdale when you were younger, and tell me how you originally met the guys or the original members of Saigon Kick. When did that all start for you? Um, well, Jason and I had been friends, uh, you know, in high school. Like I've known Jason the longest. 
And um, I graduated in 85, but I know, I've known Jason probably, God, uh, since we were like 12 or 13, maybe 14. Um, and um, I was playing in a band ar- around the block from Jason. So Jason and I played in and out of bands together before we put together Saigon Kick. So I met um, Matt Kramer and Tom Defile in 1988, and that's when we formed Saigon Kick. Um, they were, Jason was playing in a, in, in a band with those two, and that band was called Toy Soldier. So that band disbanded. In fact, uh, the drummer ended up going, he was playing with um, River Phoenix. River had a band yeah. before he passed. And yeah, so Jason, Jason was playing this guy named Josh. Josh was the drummer that left um, Toy Soldier and then he played with, uh, with River. So once that, the band, that, that band was done, uh, Jake gave me a call and, you know, we started talking again. We, Jay, we left today. I think Jason probably fired me like two or three bands before <laughs> Saigon Kick. It's like, you know, the running joke. Right. Um, which is a really funny word to say when you're 13 or 14. <laughs> right. He fired me. It's like, dude. So, yeah, we put the band uh, together in October of 88 is when the band first got together. And we played our first show in November of 88. And, you know, we were off and running. And two years later, we got signed. And um, a lot of people also don't know that Brian Warner, who is Marilyn Manson, Brian did all of our press. So he was, uh, you know, pivotal in getting us into magazines. You're kidding me. I I never heard that before ever. Wow. Really? Yes. People don't... People don't know this. It's it's odd, but Brian was great, and he still is. He he's a guy. He always was at the warehouse. In fact, he painted Matt's combat boots with the with the uh, sunflowers on them. No and way. And um, yeah, but but Brian used to hang out with us all the time, and and um, he he was an up and coming journalist at that point, and uh, he got us in all the cool magazines because he was such a great writer. So we got us in Twenty Fifth Parallel and Rag and. Uh, Billboard magazine that ended up on Jason Flom's desk from Atlantic Records. Skid Row was playing in South Florida at Summers on the Beach. And we went to an ATM. We took all our money out and we went to bribe Summers. We're like, you, we got to open up for Skid Row. And they're like, we don't want you on this. It's, it's already sold out. You know, you guys would sell this out yourselves. We don't need you. And we're like, we got to open up for Skid Row because John Bon Jovi might be there. You know, like we're kids. We don't know how it all works. So we take out this money to bribe him. And he goes, you guys are insane. Fine. You can have the show. <laughs> and it was from doing that show that Rachel Boland's uh, tech, Ronzo, heard us sound checking and he told Flom about us. No way. So it was like this whole chain of events that happened. So Flommy's like Saigon kick. And then Ronzo's like, you got to sign Saigon kick. And that's what started the whole thing. Was this the plan for you? Like, okay, you're in a band and you guys are having fun and you want to, you know, make it, you want to get signed. Um, but like, was that the plan for you after high school? Were you thinking about college and another direction, another career or was it just you yes. were playing music and you were just going to you know do that until you couldn't do it anymore and then you'd figure it out? No, I was uh, I worked for Westinghouse and I was going to be an architect and I was in a golf pro. So I was on the golf team in high school and um, I was like, OK, well, you know, I, I definitely want to pursue golfing. Um, and, but I was working for Westinghouse. And at that point, this is 1985, they had um, a new program. So they offered me a scholarship. And the CAD system, which was the uh, computer drafting system, had just come on the market. And, uh, but I was in drafting, so I wanted to be an architect, and I was doing these drawings for Westinghouse. So they offered me a scholarship uh, and, and, and a job at Westinghouse. And, um, well, then Motley Crue came out. And I was like in 83 and I'm like, hold on a second. Let me rethink this. And uh, slowly I left the golf team. And then at the end of the, uh, I graduated and I, I did well in high school, you know, um, and I had basically that was the plan. And then, you know, I just said to my parents, look, I, I like to play drums. And they, and they went, great. You just got to, you know, just get a job and we'll support you the whole way. And, and sure as shit, I I um, ended up on a lawn service like the next week after graduating. And four years later, I had a record deal. So it was really my college in a sense. When Saigon Kick was formed, there was no way we weren't getting signed. Right. That was our, and, and it's funny, I just did a, a drumathon event and, um, with, uh, with Jim and DeAnda and, 
and Gina Shock and the Go Go's, and we were all sitting backstage. And I'm like, had, did, at any point in your life, did you ever think you weren't going to get a record deal? And all of us were like, nope. That's just what we we didn't know any better. So we were, you know, maybe we were naive or whatever you want to call it, but we weren't taking no for an answer. And that's how Saigon Kick was, man. So you're talking signed in '88 ish. And then just a couple of years later, big hit on the radio, which was, you know, and, and all your big fans know this, but everybody that knows Saigon Kick knows Love is on the Way, which is the, you yeah. know, the softest song that you have on the Lizard. It's a really heavy album. How did you come up with that song? Was that record label people saying like, hey, the power ballad, that's a big thing. Let's put this out because it's honestly like nothing else on the record yeah no we um we look they always say you have a lifetime to write your first record and then you know two months to write your second right. but basically um brian chris who's a pd over in south florida oh i know who he was uh, yeah. one of well he loved that song and um they had you know the thing where they would debut songs and they spun it and the, the phones lit up and i remember we were in mexico shooting uh the hostile youth video and um, it was just my, my, my wife at the time was in hospital with my giving about to give birth to my daughter, Talia. And we, you know, I get a beep. This is, I'm, I'm really aging myself. We had beepers back then. <laughs> this 911 beep. I'm in the middle of a jungle in Mexico and I got to try to find a phone because my, you know, my wife's, you know, paging me from, an, from the, uh, the, the hospital. And nonetheless, I ended up getting. Um, getting home in time. My daughter, I got home like on a, on a Sunday or Monday. My daughter was born on Tuesday, but um, when she was born, they announced Love is on the Way was number one in South Florida at the time. We just got done shooting the video for Hostile Youth, thinking that that's going to be the single, we'll set up, you know, we, you have a plan of like three songs, you know, like we'll come out hard here, we'll put the second one as kind of a, like all I want, to t whatever would be like right. a hit, but it's not and then Love is on the Way, which is the ballad to kind of, you know, get the get the kids ready to hear. And that's not what happened. So Love is on the Way came out and it was it just it got momentum so fast. Um, and it went to number one on MTV. And all of a sudden we're on MTV. Like this whole thing just went so crazy, so fast. Um, and, you know, the only thing you could do is uh, is just hold on and, 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 you know, hang on for your life. And hopefully when the dust settles, there's something there that you can make of a career or. Phil, do you consider when that song hit MTV, do you consider that being you and or the band's big break? Because your life had to change instantly and dramatically from that moment on. Yeah. Well, a hit does that. I mean, they, as they say, they take your calls. Um, so, but it, but it doesn't last. You know, uh, unfortunately, you get that taste, though, and uh, it's like chasing the dragon. You know, it's like, man, that first getting that hit and all of a sudden you're recognized and all of a sudden, you know, people uh, are taking your calls and you get to do things. And, and then it's as quick as it came, it's gone. You know, I, I say, you know, we got 14 minutes because grunge hit. You know, like we didn't even get a chance to ride the wave because grunge, you know, uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit just came out and uh, annihilated the, the industry, you know, like it was, it was like that. And, um, you know, we, had, and here's the, here's the sad part, I think, is that Saigon Kick was a grunge band all the way through. We were doing dual vocals when, you know, all that shit was going on. We did, we were doing them in the eighties, you know, and, and we could have easily stood ground with the grunge, that grunge movement. You know, we, we looked like crap. Like we were just a rock band, man. You know, yeah. like we yeah. weren't trying to do anything. We were just playing music and, and trying to get good. That's it. That, that's all we were doing. And, and, and we could have easily stood ground in that grunge movement and, and did some really good business. And, um, but they didn't know what to do with us, man. Love is on the way. It was like, it was a double edged sword. But you know what? I don't regret any of it because you shouldn't. Um, uh, it's no, I don't. I'd rather have a hit than not have it. Right. And, um, having that really, um, I got to meet some really great people. I eventually went on to be a, a, a professional drummer, you know, an actual drummer that got hired in bands and played on records. And, uh, it was all because of Saigon Kick. So, you know, the, um, we are no different than any other band. You deal with the industry. You're young. Um, you know, if, if I knew now what I, if I knew then what I knew now, that kind of thing. But coulda, shoulda, woulda. We lived it. 
whatever we did, we made some mistakes, we made greatness, you know, we, and that's it. You move on and you use whatever you did to go further and hopefully help others. You know, that's it. That's all you can do. Bill, tell me about the documentary uh, that you came out with about 20 years ago. I remember seeing yeah. a trailer yeah. for it and I, and I actually watched the, the, the whole thing and I was, I had like anxiety attacks through most of it. Um, Waking Up Dead yeah. was, was the name of it. Um, tell me yeah. why you wanted to put yourself out there because you, you did, you put your everything yeah. out there. You showed regular ham and eggers, what rock and roll and the lifestyle was the sex, the drugs, all of it. So why did you make yeah. it? And I'm glad that you didn't wake up dead. You are alive and here to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a, a project. Um, Fabio Jaffe, a friend of mine, is a director. He was uh, covering um, Kiss, believe it or not, on the, the last uh, leg of the because on that tour, that was supposed to be their, fi their farewell tour that we were opening up for uh, with um, and had Gene, Gene uh, I'm sorry, um, Peter and Ace were in the band. It was the original band. So they were there doing a news piece. He was a cameraman. We started talking and um, he came up with this concept to do you want to do a documentary and kind of show the dirty part of music or and it, it would basically be me for three years. He'd follow me around and all that stuff. And, you know, at the time, it, it, it seemed like a good idea. I mean, in hindsight, would I would have done it now? No, probably not. I mean, but it was that mindset. And, and quite frankly, it, maybe it saved my life. Um, it, it's a lot. It's hard. It's, it's, it's a lot to look at. You know, I, I haven't watched it. I won't watch it, actually. Really? Um, but, you know, I met, I've met so many people, um, uh, musicians and rock stars, huge rock stars that went, dude, I saw that that documentary holy shit you know like boy i tell you and i you know i've been able to help others too uh people have called me you know uh, i'm not going to name names but you know rock stars that everyone knows have called me and said hey man i need some help can you help me wow there or help me there and i and i gladly uh was able to help them and put them in touch with people if, if i had to be the guy that came out and did it so other people can get help and do it you know without being Scene. I'm good with that. Funny story. I, w I went to see Rob Zombie in um, Nashville, and I was backstage, and John Five walked past me, and he looked like he saw a ghost, and because um, he had just seen the documentary, he came out and he was like, "Oh my God, dude, he's he's out there. That's who he, he's alive." Like he was shocked <laughs> that I was alive, um, and and it's true. I mean, there's some serious crap going on in that thing, and um, not my finest moment, but it's not supposed to be your finest moment. You know, um, I had and have an issue. It, you know, you're an addict till you die. So I just don't want that to kill me. What about so, Playgirl? Any regrets on Playgirl? <laughs> no. You, did you see my junk? Why I didn't. I, I, I honest, I can't say that I have, but <laughs> I heard it was impressive. <laughs> well, it isn't called the Hulk for nothing. No. Um, yeah. No. I, again, look. You're talking about you know stuff that I I loved. I, I I still do. I think it's great. Look, I, I at the time I had the body and the dunk to do it, so I did it. Um, yeah, man. I have and, and and you know, look, I have no problems with nudity. I've been a nudist for thirty years. I don't care. You know, like I I if people are uptight over nudity, that's their problem. Right. I don't I don't, I don't get naked in front of people. I mean, I'm saying, but if you know, it's just. Uh, it's like anything else. It's, it's, you know, there's a problem with Playgirl, and they'll pick it up. <clears throat> if well, you're looking at it and you co you're questioning it, then why the hell are you looking at it? Right. <laughs> so, so with all of these jobs that you know you're telling me about, what was your very first job, first paying gig ever? First paying gig was uh, you know back in the '80s. Do you remember the malls that had the pizza place? It had this uh, basically like Fast Times at Ridgemont High. It had the, the movie, uh, and then you had the the game room. So it was like I worked at this place called Don Chichio's, and uh, it was a, a a pizza place. And I made pizzas. I started summer when I was fourteen. He paid me three dollars an hour in cash under the table. <laughs> okay. And um, I, dude, I thought I was rich because I was make. I worked seventy hours a week. I was like a workaholic. <laughs> and uh, 
I, I get out of there like two hundred and ten dollars in cash, and I'm like, I am king of the world. Yeah, now. but Don Ciccio and, uh, was breaking yeah. child labor laws, though. Seriously, he it, he was a uh, he was a made guy. He's a mo- you know a mobster. So he was. I mean, Cheech, the, you know, in Italian. That's basically, you know, the boss. And, uh, yeah, so um, he had a couple of locations. One was on the, the pier at Pompano Beach. So, uh, and then he had like a Chuck E. Cheese. And eventually I would just end up managing the place and um, all, through the three stores. But, yeah, I, that's, that's where I worked, you know, from 14 until we got a record deal, basically. Wow. Let's talk about Saigon Kick. I mean, look, a lot of people know the history. You know, bands break up. Yeah. It's a brotherhood. You know, you have different um, personalities. And when you're t- together uh, for a long period of time, you know, things, you know, you can drive apart. So Saigon yeah. Kick breaks up whenever that is in the 90s. And now you decided to come back together and do a 30th anniversary tour of the the water record so where did that right. whole thing start and how did you guys you know all again come together for the for the common goal here well the, the um uh, back in 92 um matt had left the band when we went to do the record the water record in sweden so that left me uh, uh jason and chris so we ended up doing the water record, and then we did another record after that called Devil in Details that was on a different label. And, um, and that was pretty much the end of Saigon Kick at that point. So the one thing that we never did was tour on the water record. Two reasons. One, the hit record had Matt on it, and he had left the band already. And the water record, uh, you know, didn't do that well, and the internal part of the band was just not working. So we never really had a chance to kick the tires on that record live or devil the water record however did huge business overseas to me those are the records that are a lot of fun because we really kind of pushed each other um especially the water record because we were stuck in in sweden without a singer now we had to go okay well how are we gonna salvage this with atlantic uh breathing down our necks so uh, and it's also oddly one of the favorite records of all the fans with Matt leaving and the band turmoil. So I never really appreciated that record till later. And now that I listen to it, I'm like, this is a cool record. Like this is something. And I always wanted to tour this record and, um, and play it for the fans because we hadn't done that. Um, I know for a fact that this experience for me um, has really helped uh, with Jason and I, because Jason and I, you know, always had turmoil in our relationship. And um, as adults now, as older guys, we finally are able just to talk. And, and we've had some really deep conversations. And I, that to me, even if we never played a show, I think that is, was the greatest part about this. Because we actually became friends again. Do you think a big part of that, though, is that you guys are older now? If you've gotten your life together and you're doing great. And now, do you think that is a reason that you guys now are, are, you know, friends, and then the past is the past. Yeah, I mean, that's some of it. But before you get to that point, you have to see your part in things, right? So you have to be able to put your guard down and, and talk about stuff. I, I remember uh, uh, one of my best friends in the world, um, for like a year, I, I, we were having issues, right? I didn't know why. And I, I finally got a hold of him and I go, I go, can we talk? Like, what's going on? He goes, yeah, we could talk if you want to hear it. And I said, yeah. And he told me some stuff and I was embarrassed as hell. Um, but I was able to see my part in something that I wasn't even, that I was completely oblivious to. Okay. Now, unfortunately today, we have an epidemic of people that can't say they're wrong. You know, we see it in politics, we see it in, in bands, we see it in, in life. People you know, everybody has to be right. And that's just not the case. And sometimes you're wrong, all right? It doesn't matter. And it's okay. Just get on with it. And I had to look at myself in Saigon Kick and stop pointing fingers at everybody else and kind of look in the mirror and go, wait a minute, maybe I did have a part in that. Maybe that happened because I did this. And that was my biggest and that, that's life to me. I've been doing that for years now and, 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 and trying to make amends with people and just see my part in a lot of crap. 
because ultimately nothing was malicious. It was just life. Right. And, 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 and if you're wrong in that time, that's okay. If you go out of your way to be, to be manipulating and try to, you know, do some harm to someone, that's a different story. But if you're just getting through life and you made decisions that were terrible and you didn't see them and you can, and luckily a guy will pick up a phone and you go, Hey man, I'm sorry about that. I, you know, and we, that's the, that's the kind of conversations Jason and I have had. Um, and, and that's, that takes a lot. That takes a big man uh, on, on both our ends to admit that you're number one wrong, that you were, you know, you had this flaw or whatever. And, um, and because that's the only way you can get past it. You just can't say, oh, well, it happened 30 years ago. So forget it. No, it's not going to be, ever be forgotten. Because we all need closure in some respect. Right. And he needed closure as much as I did. This is great, though. I mean, you know, uh, uh, the fans have been waiting for Saigon kick, and, and now it's uh, it's happening, especially uh, in Tampa. Like you mentioned, it's May 24th. It's at the Capitol Theater, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I haven't seen you in a four, five, six years, something like that. So uh, I'm looking at seeing all you guys. And um, thanks again. All right, I'll talk to you soon. All right, buddy. Take care. Bye. Okay, so Saigon Kick in Florida in the late 80s and early 90s was a big band. And I remember seeing them at uh, some local clubs when I was in high school because I went to Sarasota High School. So they were kind of like a local band. They're from Fort Lauderdale, and their music was pretty heavy. It was definitely in the line of a lot of the grunge bands that were coming out at the time. Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, that kind of stuff. Heavy. But there was a program director at a radio station in South Florida that identified their ballad on the album The Lizard, which was called Love Is On The Way, was a big hit. And he was right. Uh, he actually played that on his radio station and it crossed over to top 40 and it became a major hit overnight on MTV was everywhere. So I would imagine that was Phil and Saigon kicks big break all of a sudden goes from a, a local band to, you know, a national band that everybody is hearing on the radio and seeing on TV. Yes, Phil had dreams of being in a rock band, but uh, not necessarily his plan. He wanted to be an architect. He was a draftsman when he was in high school. He got a scholarship uh, to work uh, with uh, Westinghouse. So that was his plan. Even though he said he had dreams of being a professional golfer, he played on the golf team in high school, and he wanted to be a pro golfer. I saw a lot of similarities in Phil's story as, you know, I wanted to be a pro golfer, and I was at a country club for a little bit. I played on my high school golf team, and uh, my father was an architect. So again, I saw a lot of similarities between Phil's story and my story. Phil's jobs, though, think about it. The draftsman when he was in high school, you know, he's an editor right now for an ad agency. He's been in documentaries and made documentaries. He's been a stand-up comedian, of course, a drummer, professional drummer in rock bands. He is uh, an author. He's written a book. He's in the adult film industry as not only an actor, but uh, I believe he has a mold of his junk out there. I haven't seen it, but I heard it's pretty impressive, and I'll take everybody's word for it. And of course, his first job working at a pizza place in the mall for an Italian guy in the mob who obviously didn't know much about child labor laws. Phil was working 70 hours a week when he was only 14 years old. But he said, hey, I had 200 bucks in my pocket. I thought I was rich. And he worked for that pizza place. Uh, they had three locations and he did everything from making pies to eventually becoming the manager of one of the stores. He did that up until he got signed to a major record label uh, with the band Saigon Kick. A renaissance man, if you will, Phil Verone, reuniting with the band Saigon Kick, going on tour uh, starting in just a few months. It's a great story. He overcame substance abuse. He's been able to help other people with their substance abuse issues because of his documentary, Waking Up Dead. Go check that out if you ever get a chance. On Instagram and threads, Real Phil Verone. 
Thanks to everybody for listening. Of course, if you like this podcast, please subscribe. Would love you to give us a five-star rating, leave a review. Also, our new YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash the at sign celebrity jobber and available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. We're on them all. Until next week, this has been another episode of Celebrity Jobber. See you next time. I'm Jeff Zito.